Good morning, astronomy students. Today is uh, October 18th. This is the start of a new week, and we are actually ending a big section of this class. Okay. Uh, this week will be the last part of uh, the solar system. We're going to embark basically on a new mission starting from next week, where we're going to go to the stars and way beyond that. Okay, so we're going to discover, first of all, some of the tools used by astronomers, astronomers to study the stars, namely uh, optics. Now, when I say optics, I don't mean really light that we have in the visible region. Also, it could include the radio waves, the ones that are very long wavelength used for uh, nowadays, at least on Earth, in telecommunications. But actually, it's used also to, uh, to spot some of the objects that are very large and emitting very long wavelength. And also, we're going to go also and explore the short wavelength, like the UV radiation and the X-rays and so on and so forth. So we have to spend a little bit of time talking about basically electromagnetism and electricity, basically, I'm sorry, electromagnetic radiation to help us basically explore stuff that is related to the stars. So we're going to immediately after we do the radiation, we're going to talk about the sun. Uh, because, look, the pattern is this. When we wanted to explore the solar system, we started with Earth. Because the Earth is within our reach, we can basically uh, understand it and we can take what we learn from it and try to expand it to the objects in the solar system. Then we went step by step, learning more and more about the solar system. We talked about all kinds of planets. We divided the solar system and an inner path and an outer part and so on and so forth. And we discussed the four planets inside, the four planets outside. We started talking about other than planets, the big large objects in the solar system. It turns out that there are six of them. Other than the planets. So the planets are by far the most important, the biggest ones. Then we have, uh, some of these objects, actually the six objects are larger than one of the planets, Mercury. Uh, and those six objects are the four moons of, 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 uh, of uh, Jupiter, namely Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, followed by another moon from Saturn, which is big, actually. It's the second biggest moon in the solar system after Ganymede. And that moon for Saturn is actually uh, Titan. And then the Earth's moon. Those are the six largest satellites, if you wish. The Earth's moon turned out to be an exception to the rule in a sense that the Earth really is an inner planet, should not really have a moon. So we discussed this extensively when we talk about the moon, and we discovered basically how the Earth came, out, came to have that moon, not only a moon, but it's a large moon. Then uh, we're going to talk about that more actually in depth today, but that's the solar system in a nutshell. Of course, we have the dwarf planets or the protoids, as they are called sometimes. And then we talk about the TNOs, the trans-Neptunian objects. And uh, today, actually, we're going to talk about two other kind of things, namely the, uh, the satellites in general and their big characteristics and so on and so forth which as I was saying, they really happen for the outer planets. So we're gonna focus on the outer planets. And then we're gonna talk about the comets because that's another feature of the solar system. And we're gonna conclude everything with the Oort cloud, which is the extent of the effect of the gravitational effect, if you wish, of the sun. So that's the extent of the sun. So we're done. we will be done with the solar system this week. And then we will start with the, the, the stars. Obviously, following the same pattern that we're developing right now, we're gonna start with the sun, because again, it's the closest object, the closest star to us, that somehow we have a better understanding than, of course, the further away stars. We're gonna talk about the sun, what we know about it, then we're gonna take that and start to model it with the rest of the suns. It turns out the sun is an average star in a lot of respects, okay? In terms of size, in terms of lifetime, in terms of activities and things like that. Then we're going to learn about the two extremes uh, of the sun, uh, stars. Stars that are too big, stars that are too small. Turns out the smaller stars are actually far more in the in the in the in the, in the, in the, in the 
distributed. Basically, uh, we're talking about the galaxy and we didn't reach that point yet, but in terms of the stars that are out there in the galaxy, the smaller stars, of course, they are far more. And then we're gonna classify the stars into different groups based on some characteristics, basically based on how big they are, based on how much luminosity they have, based on their lifetime, based on some key properties. We're going to classify them also to some extent in terms of their composition. The stars are mainly hydrogen and helium, just like the outer planets, okay? But there are some very, very first generation stars versus second generation stars and all that kinds of things. So we're going to learn more and more about the stars. Okay, taking into account the fact that we start with our own and then we expand on other stars in the vicinity, which are not too far from where we are. And when I say vicinity, a star that is a thousand light years from here is to some extent nearby, okay? Because then we're gonna group things and it turns out that these stars, they clutter in big groups of, of galaxies. Before we do that, there are other strange objects that we, initially thought that they could not exist because the theory predicted that they should exist, but it turns out they are real. One of them is of course the neutron stars. Neutron stars are strange things. They are mainly, they produce tremendous amounts of magnetic fields, things that are unbelievable. They are so dense that basically they don't have anything but neutrons in them. So the proton and the electron they are forced by sheer force of gravity to fuse and become a neutron in addition to the existing neutrons already. So what is inside a neutron star, it's even messier, okay? It's probably some sub elementary particles that constitute what the neutrons have. So it's really a mess thing in terms of composition, in terms of gravity, it's tremendous forces of gravity that you cannot believe. In terms of size, they're very small, extremely small, okay? So uh, those are actually strange objects and they come also in different uh, forms, okay? Different shapes, different uh, basically strength of mag magnetic fields, different kind of frequencies they emit and so on and so forth, okay? And we classify those two. Beyond that, there is even stranger than that. <laughs> those are uh, black holes. And black holes also, they have different sizes. Are we talking about black holes that existed from the time when the universe was formed? Are we talking about the collapse of some big stars to a black hole? So black holes, they have different sizes also. You have the small black holes, you have the medium-sized black holes, which are hard to find. And then you have the supermassive black holes, like the one that exists in our uh, uh, the heart of our own galaxy, which is in the location of uh, near the constellation Sagittarius, it's actually called the Sagittarius uh, A star. So that is a supermassive, several million times the size of the mass of the Earth. So those are some of strange objects. Then we're going to classify everything, and we have, of course, the concept of a galaxy. You see the pattern now. When we started talking about the solar system, we started immediately with what we know best, which is Earth. Then we expanded our horizon and we learned more about other things in the solar system. When we talked about the stars, we took our sun, our star, as first step, and then we expanded on the, based on what we know about the, uh, the sun, other stars. The same thing we're gonna do with the, the galaxies. We're gonna take our own Milky Way galaxy and learn its structure and the different basically uh, uh, shape that it has and the bulge that it has in the center and the different arms it has and the all kinds of things. And that should teach us something about the star, the galaxy. The galaxies also become a different uh, classification depending on their age. So again, we're gonna learn more about that down the road as we explore the galaxies. Galaxies interact with one another, they collide with one another, they consume each other. As a matter of fact, our own galaxy is in the process of taking other galaxies. It took other galaxies in the past and it's taking more. I'm thinking more of the Magellanic clouds, which are very, very nearby uh, 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 galaxies, smaller dwarf galaxies, if you want to call them that way, because they are a lot smaller, okay? Our own galaxy is actually, fate is actually at stake because of the fact that it is actually in collision path with another big galaxy, bigger galaxy, namely Andromeda, which is in the nearby about 2.5 million light years away from here. So 
So it's really, that's another thing that is going to happen in the field. There is actually a third big galaxy also in the neighborhood, also Triangulum, which is actually another thing that is going to happen. So we're going to talk about the evolution of galaxies because they go through process too. They age. They go through a process where they make stars at a very high rate. They make them at a low rate and so on and so forth. And the stars in them, they are distributed depending on how they are. And then in every single galaxy, it turns out it has this kind of things. One of the things that I did not mention, and it's a really strange thing to explain the behavior of galaxies is dark matter. Without it, galaxies do not make sense. I mean, we cannot really understand the, 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 the structure of the galaxies in general without really invoking dark matter. So dark matter has a lot of effects that we can see directly. First of all, in terms of the speed with which stars move around the center of the galaxy, this could not be explained by the amount of matter that we can count for. So there is a missing matter, if you wish, that is out there that we don't know what it is. The reason why we call it dark is because we don't know what it is. And then there is other phenomenon that was predicted by the theory and uh, what I'm talking about in here is gravitational lensing, which can be sometimes explained by regular matter, but sometimes can only be explained by uh, dark matter. So there are all kinds of things that suggest the, the existence of this matter, which is really not just a, a side note, if you wish, of the stuff that is out there in the universe. As a matter of fact, the regular matter that you and I are made up and all of the stars and the galaxies, I mean, the ones that we see at least and the, 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 the planets and the moons and all of the asteroids and the comets and everything are made up of is of actually the, the, com, the, the, the afterthought, if you wish. Dark matter is actually out there and it's out there with abundance, with a lot far more of it than actual matter that we know of. So this is the stuff that we talk about when we talk about this one. Then the galaxies, as I was saying, interact with one another and they move around and so on and so forth. But the entire picture in here, when you zoom out, is that you have clusters of them, of galaxies, and those clusters of them form a huge, basically, uh, uh, patterns in the, in the universe that forms out there. And the universe as a whole, which has can be divided into two group, two kinds of universes. The one we can see, because of the limitations of how fast the speed of light, the light can, can move and the one that we, we can see. So there is the observable universe and the one, the actual universe out there. So we're gonna talk about the universe as a whole and then we talk about the evolution of the universe. And there are some outstanding theories out there about our own universe. Is our own universe it? Or there is even a hyper universe out there where our universe is nothing but an island of other universes out there. So, of course, we're reaching now the point where science starts to meet, uh, reach its limitations in terms of uh, testing and in terms of observation, because even the universe itself, when it comes to observability, is not the entire picture that we see. We can see only what we can see, and that is the observable universe. That's beyond that. We know it's out there, and there is evidence for it, and we can argue for it, but we can never get to the point where we see it. The universe, of course, evolved, at least this universe that we know of, and then it's going to have an end, and we're going to talk about that, and that is the last part of this class, cosmology. But we're going to leave some lingering points in there, and that is the fact, or, or at least some hypotheses about our actual universe, is it? It or there are some other universes out there that have different compositions, different laws, different laws of physics, different kinds of things that we can talk about. But I, we're going to leave that actually toward maybe the last week or so. Okay. So this is where we stand right now. We are at the end of one section of astronomy, which is a big deal, which is really the solar system. So let me share with you the screen so that we can. Uh, talk about a few things in here, what we have this week, share. Okay. So what do we have? Before I do that, before I mention that, and I know we have the objectives. This is the pattern that we've been seeing. This is basically what we have seen so far. We have the review from the previous week. Okay. 
I've been using sometimes video, sometimes recording, sometimes actual uh, text. So this is actually a text. It talks about basically the previous week, which dealt with Unit 48, which is an example from the solar system, namely Venus. Venus is a fascinating object by itself because of the similarities and differences with Earth. And actually, it's an inner planet that gives us a contract to the uh, contrast to a lot of other things that we know about the solar system. Uh, this is the objective. This is the recording where it's going to go in here. And then we have the two units, 47 and 48, and we have a quiz. So let me get into the objective so that we're all on the same page to, so that we see everything in here. The objective, of course, we have the lunar observation, which is a weekly activity. Now you have completed task one. You still have task two this week observations. Today, where I am at is cloudy. I don't know, we're not too far away, we're about 100 miles away, so that should be similar conditions. So uh, again, you're going to receive a reminder from me tomorrow about the observations. So if you think Wednesday is going to be cloudy and tomorrow is not, then I'd rather do the observations tomorrow. Okay. So uh, that's basically the reminder, so please follow those instructions. The retrograde motion of Mars is due this Saturday. So if you haven't started yet on it, this is urgent matter now that you really have to start on it. Of course, we have a quiz also this week. It's due still, you have plenty of time for that, so we can take your time doing this quiz. But let's focus on the project in here, which is an important pro aspect in here. So. Let me go back home here because I'm logged in as a student. So hopefully you're seeing the same stuff as I am seeing. So this week again, of course the quiz is due on, uh, oh man, I need to change the quiz. I think it's not supposed to be due to, to the 22nd. It's supposed to be due next week. So I'll, I'll fix that, okay? But before I do that, let me talk about the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the project, the retrograde motion of Mars, the project, okay? The project was assigned way back in week seven. And then we came on week eight and we did the whole session on it, over an hour on it. So if they click on that, actually we did it on October 7th, we have a recording of over an hour on it, okay? I urge you strongly to go through this one again if you did not, to follow the instructions, to follow the examples I mentioned in then and complete your project. So if you didn't do it by now, you really have to finish it in here, okay? So here is the deal. I know you're eager to come in and here and ask about the discussion points in here. And that is to do your project this week, okay? Don't worry about this part because I'm going to change it to next week, okay? Because again, the focus is on the projects. So you have a project in here, okay? The discussion item is actually left for next week also. So I'm going to move this one to next week too, okay? Most likely the 28th. So let's go back into the objectives. So by far, the biggest deal this week is this one because it's due this Saturday. So you really have to finish it. Of course, you have to do your observations because without your observations, you're not gonna complete the second project. And then you will have a third project starting from next week because from next week, we're gonna start talking about radiation and things like that and the laws of how temperature affects the, the frequency of the light emitted and so on and so forth. So we're gonna be uh, including that there. So we're going to have that uh, other project, but before we do that, or while we're doing that, we have this lunar observation, which started last week, and then we have another observation this week, and a third one next week, and a fourth one the week after. So basically, we will have that to complete it. So again, don't forget of this doables, the things that you have to do. Doesn't mean that these not are not doables. This is reading stuff that you have to read. I mean, I know I have a summary of it in here, or at least a summary of the summary, if you wish. And I included even the PowerPoints for you guys to help you in your uh, preparation. But you still have to go through the entire sections, which are units 47 and 49 from this uh, book, and basically read through them. 
So what are they talking about? They're talking about the last basically pieces of this, uh, the puzzle when it comes to the solar system. And that is the outer satellites, the moons basically, and uh, the comets, okay? When it comes to the outer satellites, what I meant is the moons. I have a, uh, this diagram in here, it shows you the position of the different moons with respect to their host planets in the outer solar system versus that of the moon with respect to the earth. The moon is about 380,000 kilometers, 384,000 kilometers from the earth. And this scale in here, this is 100,000, this is a million, this is 10 million. Of course, 10 million is 100 times bigger than 100,000. And it looks just like it's a two step in here because this is a so-called logarithmic scale. So if I go from here to here, it's 10 steps. From here to here, it's 10 steps. But from here to here, it's 100 steps, but it doesn't show it because the logarithm, that's the properties of the logarithmic scale. But the point being in here is, forget about the scale is, you can actually see it with respect to the position of the moon with respect to the earth. The moon is here, the earth is somewhere in here, okay? Now, Io is almost the same distance from Jupiter than the earth from this uh, and then the moon from the earth. So that's basically what the point is. Io is a big moon and Jupiter is even a bigger planet. It's the biggest planet in the solar system. Although the distance is almost the same of Io with respect to Jupiter than earth, the moon with respect to the earth, the moon takes about 30 days to go once around the earth. Io takes a lot less than that, only about 42 hours. Super fast. Why? Because Jupiter is super big. If it doesn't go that fast, it's going to fall onto it. So that is the big moon. Then you have Europa, which is also another big moon. Then you have Ganymede, which is the biggest moon in the solar system. And then you have Callisto, which is the, uh, which is the, uh, third moon in the solar system. The second moon in the solar system is actually Titan. And then you have, of course, the Earth's moon, Io and Europa. Okay, those four, six objects are the big four, six objects other than the planets in the solar system. So you have eight planets that you can name, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Those are the eight big planets. The hypothetical nine planets is still, the hunt for it is still out there. And honestly, there are some competing basically theories that can dispose of it altogether. And I will talk a little bit about them when we explore the uh, outer, uh, the, 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 uh, the Oort cloud, which is the biggest structure in the solar system in terms of size. <laughs> So in addition to the eight planets, now we have the four, the six big other objects. And they are actually four moons of uh, Jupiter. In terms of proximity, we start with Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And then we have the moon of Saturn, which is Titan. And then we have the moon of Earth, which is the moon, which we call it the moon, okay? So, uh, those are the six big objects in the solar system. You might be tempted, okay, so include Triton in them. And that's probably a legitimate concern because Triton, Neptune's moon, is a big moon too, okay? Now, uh, there is an odd thing in here in this picture that you can clearly see from this picture also. It's trying to represent the orbit of these objects around their hosts' planets. It turns out, for the most part, they have a regular direction of motion and regular, which are almost circular paths around their planets. They go almost in circles. In other words, the eccentricity is practically uh, zero, if you want to, it's almost zero, okay? So uh, now you have some other objects in here and the two biggest of course are Nerid and also Triton from uh, Neptune, but you have some even for uh, Uranus, Saturn, 
and uh, actually Jupiter. And these are usually the further away uh, objects, that, that's where the, the, the oddity is. It's an oddity or an exception, if you wish, for their path around their host uh, planet. Okay. Key same point in here is Triton, which is, let me explain what that means, okay, in terms of exception. All of them, all of these moons are orbiting in almost circular paths around this, the planet in the same direction as the planet is spinning, indicating that this must have formed during the time when the planet itself was formed out of the same stuff in the same direction, more or less. Okay. So this is basically in a nutshell what that is. When you see an exception like this one, you really have to explain it. Case in Triton, for example, it's orbiting in backward, a retrograde motion. Whereas everybody is moving in the same direction where Neptune is spinning, uh, this one is actually going backward, number one. Number two also, in terms of composition, it's kind of an odd thing. It's actually it shares the same composition as Pluto than the moons of Neptune or any other moons, indicating that it's probably not a moon that formed when Neptune did, but it must have been captured by Neptune when it was ejected by the interaction between uh, uh, Saturn and uh, and uh, uh, Jupiter, and it found it in there and probably captured it, and that's exactly what probably has happened to it. So this is a captured dwarf planet by uh, Neptune itself. So this is one thing that we can tell about this, these objects in here, and probably similar stories with this one, and uh, the, the other objects. Otherwise, for the most part, are in this direction. So this is one of the main features overall. One of the biggest features, actually, uh, there is an example in here for, for uh, Uranus. Uranus is, uh, itself is spinning actually in a tilted fashion. It's about 90 degrees from where it's supposed to be because all, everybody exists. All of the other planets are going in the same direction, including Venus, by the way, which is spinning in the same direction as everybody else on the same plane. Venus's oddity in here, which is interesting, it rotates backward on its own axis. In other words, the sun rises in the opposite sizes from rises from the west and sets in the east. Okay, so this is Uranus is actually flipped backward. In other words, the North Pole is actually pointing to the sun, not the equator. Okay. And uh, that is really the, 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 the problem with, the, with, the fin, uh, with, the, with Uranus. So it's spinning backward. Now, if it does that, and all of these objects, they're spinning in the same direction, that means they formed with it too. So they rotated with it too. So they're getting its formation. That's exactly what happened to them. And this is the case for Uranus. So all of these moons are in the same directions, in the same fashion as the planet is spinning also everybody is going counterclockwise in the positive direction. So another feature of this one, before I do that, let me talk about the sizes. All of these ones are the big moons, of course. Any size more than 400 kilometers, you have enough force of gravity and due to the, the force of gravity pulling in every direction. Force of gravity is radially symmetric. It pulls in every direction in the same fashion. If you have a lot of it though, because you have a lot of material, then the, the the by symmetry the, the 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 moon that forms must be spherical object if you have a less of it that means that you don't have enough yes it's symmetrical still but you don't have enough force pulling in uh, you, you have a weak force pulling in uh, every single direction so whatever other forces that exist in there like for example the electrostatic force that the bonding if you wish of the different pieces of the the moon will be strong enough to overcome that force of gravity and the moon will have an odd shape. So it's not necessarily going to have a, a spherical shape, okay? So that is one of the conditions of you. So the force of gravity when strong enough, all the objects need to be uh, spherical objects, okay? So satellites larger than 400 kilometers are massive enough to put themselves into a spherical shape. Uh, most have, Densities that imply that they're made mainly of ice and rock. That's a common property for all of them. And many are dark, and that is because of the different, uh, whatever, uh, during the collisions, whatever dust has settled on them, and especially carbon-based dust. So that gave them that different uh, color, if you wish. Uh, they lack the shine, shineness, if you wish. They're not shiny enough. So this is basically, in a nutshell, the different satellites. 
for the outer planets. Outer planets, all of them <coughs> have rings. That's a common feature for all of the outer planets. They all do have uh, rings. Obviously, Saturn has a big ring structure. I don't know exactly where the uh, stops basically with recording, but let me uh, continue with it anyway. Because the the uh, zoom froze on me. So again, I'm sorry about that. I was talking about the ring structure for uh, the different planets, the outer planets out there. Obviously, as I was saying, Saturn has a big ring structure that can be visible with telescopes. So. Uh, but the other planets also do have rings. And as I was making the point about Uranus spinning, spinning backward, also it's ring structure in the same direction. So one thing that we really need to explain about is how these rings came out to be. It turns out because of this planets, they are all big, they are all massive in terms of the mass. And this is a common property for any object. If you have an object spinning close by, about two and a half times the size of the planet, the size of the planet. If you are very close from it, you need to spin fast just in order to stay in orbit. Or the other way, you can slow this, and that is the third law of Kepler, really, because p squared and a cubed are uh, the same quantity, basically, in the proper units. So if a is small, p is small too. That means you have. The period is very small. That means you have to spin super fast in order for you to, to have the uh, the same that a being small. So as you move super fast in this case, the force of the gravity starts to pull on all kinds of with tremendous amount that the satellite starts to break apart. Okay. And as it breaks, it makes all of these pieces in here. They're mainly about a few meters in size. Some of them probably larger. For the case of the outer planets, they're mainly made out of ice. Okay. So that's basically, and they're extremely thin layers because of, again, the conservation of angular momentum. So there, that's basically the, the, the structure. The, 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 the structure itself also has some interesting features in a the sense there are gaps in between, in between the, uh, the, the, the structures and there are different zones actually, as you can clearly see from the case of, uh, of Saturn. And actually you can see it also from the case of Neptune too. And you can see it actually, all of them, they have the different ring structures. Those gaps are most likely caused by shepherd moons, in other words, moons that basically go around and move around the objects in one side direction or the other, or actually guide them, okay? And keep them in orbit in that direction. So there, those moons are extremely small too, of their own too. So those are the, the, the structure in a nutshell. All of the outer planets have rings, okay? And as I was saying, it has to do with the size and orbiting objects that are not too far from the, uh, from the, uh, from the planet itself, okay? So this is one of the main features for the outer planet. So this is basically concludes all of the stuff. Of course, okay, I mentioned a few things in the past and that's worth uh, remembering again. So we have the asteroid belt, which is made up of mainly rocky objects. Then we have the Kuiper belt, 
which is another belt also, and they all are in the same plane. And we're going to talk about structure that is not on the same plane today, namely the Oort cloud. Uh, I was kind of a little bit busy with stuff last week. And one of the things that I was following and trying to basically so I see that it goes successfully, and that was uh, the Lucy mission. And the Lucy mission that was launched on Saturday was actually one of the objects for it is to actually study the, uh, the asteroids. And it's going to focus, of course, on the asteroid belt, well, that's a closer one. And it's going to actually look, focus on another type of asteroids that we didn't mention. And they're actually worth mentioning since we're talking about everything in the solar system. And those are called the Trojans. Trojans are another kind of asteroids that, do, do, uh, that are not in the, uh, the, the belts that I've been mentioning before. And actually, some of them are orbiting a little above and below the, uh, the ecliptic plane. And those, they usually exist in regions called the Lagrangian points. And they are mainly in the solar system around Jupiter. So Jupiter leading it are the so-called Greek Trojans. Those are actually uh, asteroids. They are in the same orbit as Jupiter. So when Jupiter is moving, it's all there always in front of it. And there are also Trojans behind it that are called Trojans. Trojans, all of them are called Trojans, actually. They are behind it, and they are moving in the same orbit also as Jupiter does, OK? Every planet has Lagrangian points, and Earth also has Lagrangian. That's what actually what the James Webb uh, telescope is going to be deployed in one of them, the one that is further away from the uh, sun. And the Earth also turned out to, be a to have a Trojan. So Trojans are different than satellites in a sense they don't, they are actually they attach to the planet, if you wish, but they don't orbit the planet. They orbit the sun still, and the same path of the planet. Okay, so those are are the the Trojans, or at least in points that are stable enough around the planet, not necessarily in the same path. But for the case of uh, Jupiter, the well known of them that are extremely large, it's probably a million of them or so, that are on the same uh, path of uh, of Jupiter, and they are too small to be seen, far away to be basically detected, but they are there actually. And uh, the Lucy mission that was launched on Saturday actually is to explore some of those explosions also. So that's another part of the solar system that we did not mention. And we're not gonna be probably talking a lot about it because we don't really know much about them, honestly, but they are out there, okay? So we're, that's the mission that we hope to, to, uh, to, to follow. It's gonna be take, it's gonna take about 12 years to complete the mission. I'm gonna go to, uh, through uh, the, a couple of uh, sling uh, basically motions from the, 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 to the, to the mission itself. I mean, the satellite itself that is going to the, that was launched is going to go around and then come back and then basically be slung by the Earth toward the, uh, its targets, which are part of the asteroid belts and also the Trojan asteroids in front and behind uh, Jupiter. So again, those are some of the structures that we have. Another structure that we have also is actually the comets. The comets are actually icy objects that, for the most part, they come from uh, the Kuiper belt or actually another uh, structure that goes beyond the Kuiper belt, namely the Oort cloud. So let me talk about the Oort cloud a little bit in here. So here is a typical comet. Here is Neptune. The blue uh, uh, path in here is Neptune. All of the planets, Saturn, Uranus, Jupiter, Jupiter is probably somewhere in here, very close from the sun. So if I say this is where Jupiter is, it's the five astronomical units. The Earth, which is one astronomical unit, is practically on the sun from this diagram. So forget about Venus and uh, Mercury. So it's a big, trying to capture a big structure here. So all of these objects, namely everything that I mentioned, all of the planets up to Neptune, all of the stuff that is mainly in the Kuiper belt, this is the Kuiper belt, is really on the same plane. When you go further away, the, 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 the pull of the gravity of the, uh, of the sun weakens to a point that that effect now is smudge, if you wish. And then the structure starts to spread throughout the entire sphere in here. This sphere is a big sphere. It's about 100,000 100, astronomical units across. I mean, in diameter. I mean, the parameter and um, radius. So in diameter, it's about 200,000 light years, 200,000 astronomical units. It's a big number, okay? This number is worth doing to understand it, what it means. Uh, 
Let me uh, new. Yes. Oh, I don't want to save this. File new. No. So let me share with you what that number means. Okay. Let me stop sharing the screen and let me share the calculator. Share the calculator. We know that light takes slightly over eight minutes to reach the Earth. And the Earth to the Sun, from the Sun that is, and the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical units. So light will take eight times 100,000, which I'm gonna write it in scientific notation, 10 to the power five, that's what 100,000 is, to the outer edge of the outer cloud. This is an estimated number, of course. Somebody will tell me, oh, it's maybe 103,000. So who cares about the 3,000, okay? We're talking about 100, but 3,000 astronomical units is a huge number, okay? <laughs> so don't make that uh, thing in there. But for basically for the Earth, from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical, so 3,000 is huge. But we're talking about 100,000 in here, the extent of the, astro uh, of the Earth cloud. So that 800,000 minutes, basically, how many hours that is? We have to divide by 60, divide by 60 to find how many hours that is. So this is how many hours and divide by also 24 hours to find how many days that is. So this is how many days I did not punch in the calculator here to tell me how many days. I don't care really about the days. I want to know how many years because this is how many years it should be. So it's 1.5 light year. So light takes one and a half years to reach the end of the Earth cloud. So let me go back into here. So this is the extent of the solar system, but the typical comet will come from that region and go through this path, which you can clearly see it's an elliptical path with a high eccentricity that's almost equal to one, probably 0 0.9 or 0 0.8 or something like that. So uh, that means that it spent most of its life, a comet does, outside of the path of Neptune, outside of the path of Jupiter, actually, very far away, frozen ice, because that's the frost line. Then as it gets closer from the sun, around, around four or five astronomical years. Remember, most of its life is spent it's in basically thousands of light years away from the Earth, from the sun. When I say the Earth or the Sun, it's the same thing. It's the same dot at this point, okay? When we're talking about these huge distances. When it's only four or five, six astronomical units, its temperature rises high enough that at that point it starts to thaw, if you wish. It starts to, <laughs> uh, 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 gas comma forms around the, the nucleus. So now there is a comma that starts to form around the nucleus. And as it gets closer and closer, because of the radiation of the sun, the, 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 uh, there is a tail that develops. The tail has actually two parts in it, a neutral part, which is a dust tail, and a charged part, which is an ion tail. Because of the fact of the charged particle that hits it from this side, this tail will always be radial away from the sun. If you draw a vector from here, it's going to be perpendicular to the surface of the sun. This one, because it's neutral, does not need that, and it can lag behind a little bit because of the inertia. So there is actually two different angles. There is an angle between them, okay? And as it gets closer, of course, this, this, this tail develops further because of the radiation push from the sun, the radiation pressure from the sun. It's always pointing away from the sun. And as it moves back in here around it, so at this point, it's moving extremely fast. The shortest distance of the life of it is here around the sun. And then as it moves further and further away, it starts to freeze again because it passes the frost line and the iron, basically the comet is lost. And basically now it's gonna be frost, solid fro uh, frozen. So right around this edge, about four or five astronomical units, it froze, it's, uh, it's, uh, it has this comma that forms around it. And then further away, it's a solid structure, icy object that spends most of its lifetime in that direction, in that side. And then only when it gets around the sun, when it heats up just enough to develop that tail, those two types of tails. In terms of structure itself, again, you have the icy structure itself, which can range from one kilometer to about 10 kilometers inside. It's a very small object. 
Okay, I think kilometer is about six miles. Okay, which is a big comet in this case. Okay, and then you have this gust and dust uh, uh, that's swept by the and uh, and the, the tail in here. So this is basically the, the this part of the structure. This is a large structure. It's a hundred thousand kilometers. Remember, the Earth is six thousand four hundred kilometers in radius. In diameter, it's about twelve thousand kilometers. So you could theoretically put about what I did the math wrong earlier. Put about ten uh, Earths in here, side by side. Furthermore, the hydrogen <coughs> envelope. It can spend about 10 million kilometers. So you can put how many in there? About 100 Earths in here. So it's a big structure. That's what the comet is, okay? And it can spend again, 100 million kilometers in this, the tail is, okay? So this is 10 million, this is 100 million. So that is basically the, the, the structure of, of it. And that is how it goes around it. And this is where it or originates from. While it's leaving, this dust is actually left behind. I'm not going to coalesce again and go back into it. So it's going to be left behind. And it's going to be in the path of different planets. So as the Earth is spinning around the sun, it's going to come across the dust that is left by comet. And as we're going through it, it appears to be uh, those, those basically meteor shower it appears to be coming from a specific constellation, depending on where they're coming from and depending on the time of the year, you see them in the, the sky. How, why do we see them like this? Is because of the fact, there's a similar fact, for example, when the rain is falling. If you're, if you're sitting in Sorry about this one again, it stopped. So, uh, so anyway, uh, let's continue this. And this is the last part of this. Uh, this. Uh, so let me share, let me uh, switch to series view again. Let me finish this, this recording quickly here with you guys. Sorry about that again. So we're talking about the meteor shower really and how that came out to be and why we look at it and we see it it's as if coming to us. It's like when you're driving in the rain and you see the droplets of the rain coming to the screen, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the window. Or if you have had a chance to drive in the snow, that is also like when it's black snow, you will see also the snow coming to the window. That's a similar fashion. And that's why we see that the meteor showers, the meteors that are formed is actually as if they are coming towards us in this direction because the earth is actually moving in their path, okay? And it finds them in its path while it's moving around the sun. And it appears that they're coming from the specific constellation depending on the time of the year, okay? So again, this is the stuff that is uh, uh, fascinating stuff that we learn about these, uh, the, the, the solar system. One of the th biggest things that we learn from the solar system is about this one in here. And I know that you guys are eager trying to know about the question of the day, okay? Let me stop sharing quickly in here because I have something in mind. Let me leave the student view in here. Obviously, don't forget to do your uh, your uh, your uh, the project. That's a key thing in here for this week. 
very, very important that we have to do that. So that's probably the point of the discussion today is to do the lunar observation, which is part of your own weekly activity right now, and also to do your, uh, your, uh, your retrograde motion as soon as possible. I already mentioned, and I can actually uh, probably send another message in here, uh, mentioned the link that we have had. So let me share with you that link again so that you guys probably were on the same page in here. So that, let me go back, share. So from previous week, from uh, week, what is it, eight? I shared the recording on a session we did October 7th. We are on October 8th, sorry, 18th. So we are, uh, we did it 11 days ago. So uh, please review that recording. That should help you a lot with your project. So please review it. And if you have any questions, please let me know about them. So this is the discussion item is to do your projects really. Of course, you have a quiz, which I'm going to, as I promise, I'm going to change the date on it. But that also is important. It helps us basically uh, retain the things that we need to retain. We will have an exam, midterm two. And that midterm is not going to be next week. It's going to be most likely the week after. Because actually, some of you are sitting in my other physics class. And uh, they have actually an exam next week. So I really don't want to have to exams from my classes at least at the same time. So that is really the, the idea behind it. But we should be ready for this uh, the, the second midterm. Thank you. Let me stop sharing in here. Thanks again. Do you guys have any questions? If not, then I'll see you guys next time. Oh.